Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman. Look, if the film's gonna be cheesy, then so is my intro. You know, I'm not so keen on this one. I figure uh, you are, but you know what? I'm ready to go. I think we can do better. Hello, I'm Phil. Welcome to my channel where I talk about all the geeky pop culture that I like to enjoy and consume. Today I'm going to be talking about Wonder Woman 1984. I watched it about a week and a half ago, whenever it first came out on streaming here in the UK, and you could pay premium prices to stream it, and I had it like available to me for 48 hours. I winced at having to pay £14.99 to watch it on my telly. I really did, especially as I don't own it. I don't mind paying like that for a DVD, fine, but the fact that I only got it for 48 hours? Oh, and it wasn't even in the cinema on a massive screen. Slightly resentful. But I'm not here to talk about the politics behind the distribution method. No, no, no. We're talking about the film itself. I watched this film and I had very mixed thoughts. And honestly, I'm kind of still processing it a little bit, even a week and a half later. There are some things in this film which I find questionable. Some questionable choices in this film. But there are also things which I really enjoyed. And so, I don't know, where it falls in terms of my enjoyment on DCEU films, probably somewhere in the middle. But there is there is definitely some good things and some bad things about this film. It's a deeply flawed film, I think. And it, it doesn't come anywhere near the first Wonder Woman film, which, for the record, I absolutely loved. Wonder Woman, the first one, one of my favourite DC films, probably of all time, but definitely of this current fictional universe which they're creating, this extended cinematic universe which they're creating. One of my favourites. Aquaman also up there. Maybe they're vying for that top spot, but the, these two, those two films that came out post-Justice League were actually really, really good and really strong films. And this one kind of drops the ball a little bit in my opinion. Partly it's because I don't think it lets anything land. I mean everything is moving at such a pace all the way through. Not many of the sort of emotional beats of it land. Everything seems quite rushed and it just doesn't feel like it gives enough time to any of the elements to really focus on them and get the audience to engage with them. That's not true for every element but it is certainly true for a lot of them so the film opens with this absolutely fantastic 15 minute opening scene at this point i was fully on board really loved that opening scene of a sort of flashback to themyscira of her childhood of wonder woman's childhood and when she was competing in these kind of games they had and she was taught a lesson at the end of it you know that you can't take shortcuts and Clearly that was going to play into the theme of the movie somehow. And uh, it was a great scene. It was a gr really well filmed. Uh, I thought, you know, okay, they're setting up something here. Very interesting thematically. As well acted. It was exciting. It was a good opening scene. Then the next hour of the film just dragged after that. Basically, it, everything from that point for the next hour felt really slow, plodding that they were sort of just spending too long on tired, tired ideas that they kind of, some of which they'd already played out in the first one. And I get what they were trying to do, um, but it just, it just felt like they, they weren't even trying with that first hour of the film. The first bit of the modern world we see, they're setting up the 1980s world. We get a montage of various 1980s things. And they kind of follow a theme. They're setting up a theme that runs throughout this movie. And I think another thing about this movie, the theming is actually really strong. There's there's good theming in this movie, but they don't they don't land it all of the time. And some of the choices they make around what some characters do uh well we'll talk about that a bit more later but the theming that seems to be set up here is that the 1980s the world that diana is now living in is a very selfish place there's lots of scenes of you know people being mugged or whatever or just general just like low level selfishness i can't remember even now what they are exactly 
but that there's lots of low-level selfishness and it culminates in this robbery in a jewelry store in a mall and then we get a sort of the only Wonder Woman action scene which we're going to get really for the next hour which was very odd <laughs> I, I don't really know how else to describe it really it was we get you know they were trying to uh, do it that she was like flashing in and out so we don't get to see much of her because she's trying to keep hidden is the idea but the thing is she's in a big mall she's there's cameras which she take out she takes out but the, the footage isn't stored in the cameras the footage will have already caught her by then and just because the camera only shows us our, her our, her feet doesn't mean that the people in the mall only saw her feet it was just a i kind of get what they were going for because at this point they've established in the continuity that you know, Wonder Woman wasn't a thing that people, like a public persona people knew about. Uh, but that's then contradicted a bit later on when he got this random sort of extra guy uh, as a policeman at, over his radio talking about Wonder Woman, literally by name. And like, how do you know that name? How do you know that name? She's not meant to be a public figure at this point. How do you know the name Wonder Woman? It's bizarre that that got left in. Anyway, so this whole scene... It was very cheesy, and I could kind of understand why maybe they were going for that. You know, get the bit of the fun 1980s vibe in there with the cheesiness, but I don't know, it just didn't quite work for me. Then we get some sort of setups of some supporting characters, as well as setting up what Diana's life is like, very insular, you know, she, she goes to work, she does her job, she goes home, is very lonely. And then we get the uh, Barbara, is it Barbara? It is Barbara, isn't it? I've forgotten the names already. Barbara, who is her colleague, her new colleague at the museum that she's working at, the Smithsonian. And Barbara is, and again, this might be them trying to evoke the 1980s, but she's the stereotypical trope of sort of slightly bumbling, nerdy woman who, you know, becomes a villain and, and suddenly gains in loads of confidence it, it's it's such a played out i mean this is basically she's basically catwoman in this she's catwoman and well who else uh poison ivy in that terrible batman film and you know just so many this 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 trope has been done to death and I don't know. I don't think they really added anything particularly interesting to it with this one. It was okay. It was it, there was it wasn't bad. It's just that you kind of knew exactly how it was going to go from the moment she came in and tripped over, you know, fell with her stuff all over the floor and everyone was being mean to her and not helping her. From that moment, you knew exactly where her storyline was going. So there was no surprise in there. But I don't want to be completely down on it. I mean, her performance was was fine she she did a good performance it wasn't it wasn't bad in that sense at all i, I really don't want to be too harsh on this film because it you know overall i in, i had an enjoyable time watching it um and currently i'm coming across sounding like i hated it i did not hate this film it's a perfectly adequate film it just doesn't quite live up to the first film so this girl is is tasked with investigating this artifact um by the fbi who um and, she, and turns out it's a wishing stone like a monkey's paw type wishing stone there will be consequences we find out but uh i tell you what one thing that they i thought they would do that would have been a trope but it's kind of weird that they didn't do it is that the first wish that gets granted in this is a guy getting a cup of coffee and as far as i can figure out we never saw anything bad happen to him because he got his coffee we never saw the pri the price being paid for that coffee uh that he got from his first wish from that guy's random wish uh which you know i was expecting like the moment i saw him wish that i was like ah something's gonna happen to him and that's how they're gonna realize and yes that would have been a trope and maybe who knows if they'd done it maybe i would have been criticizing it i don't know but, but perhaps because i was expecting it and it didn't happen, it felt weird. So Barbara, still not knowing that this is an actual true wishing stone that will grant wishes, wishes to be more like Diana. Unbeknownst to her, that will include superpowers. Diana, when she gets hold of it, also not knowing that it's a real artifact, 
wishes for Steve. Her long lost love from World War One. And that is where I am very conflicted about where the story goes. But he's in somebody else's body. And there is various things about that which are strange and certainly strange in her terms of how people react as a plot device i think it's perfectly fine but the issues that it raised i don't think were addressed as they probably should have been let's start simple she's convinced it's steve way too quickly and i suppose you could argue that maybe you know she's an amazon she's connected with the gods she's got this sick sense about these sort of things and she can just tell and it's her true love she can tell but it just seemed a bit quick. But one of the biggest thing is there is no discussion at all around this guy and his whose body has been taken over by the soul of Steve and the the mind of Steve. There's no discussion about his life and what they're potentially taking away from him. I mean, it's not even like briefly checked as like, oh, should we be worried? Like, it doesn't even come up now. I'm conflicted about that because on one hand, it fits the themes of the film very well. And if there's one thing I will definitely give this film for, very strong theming. It has very strong theming throughout. And that is that uh, uh, the whole world is selfish. Everyone is selfish. There's selfishness in everyone. And that includes Diana. And the fact that she, you know, and the fact that her and Steve initially don't talk about or mention or even consider this guy's life that's part of that that's part of this whole selfishness and there are issues around consent which obviously is an issue in this because he is in somebody else's body and he is making that body do things that that person may not want to do so there are issues there but they all kind of play into the theme of selfishness a little bit and i i do kind of wish it had been brought up somewhere but I can get why they fit into the themes. Diana and indeed Steve Trevor is that the selfishness of the world doesn't doesn't stop with them. They are selfish too. There's bits of them, you know, that they've got their love back. They've got their together again. And for a period of the film, they don't want to give that up. It makes perfect sense in terms of the theming of the film. Where I think they went wrong was the reason, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, the reason why Diana decided to give Steve up and to return him wasn't anything to do with realising that what she was doing was selfish from that perspective. It was because she was losing her powers and she couldn't defeat the bad guy without her powers or the bad guys without her powers and so in the world was going to chaos around them and they needed to stop stop it all and so they she gave steve up to save the world which is a, a very selfless act sure but it didn't address the initial selfishness the core of the selfishness that was to do with diana not even thinking about whatever this guy's name was, whose body Steve was in. That selfish that selfish act was just never addressed. And I kind of feel like it would have been a much stronger ending uh, to that particular bit of the arc if they had just dealt with that. And, and part of the reason why she'd given it up was not just to save the world, but because she had realised that this person was deserved to have their life back and to have their body back and it was selfish of them to keep it away from them just because they wanted to be together but that just wasn't addressed so that i think is my biggest problem with this film that i think the it, the theming which is brilliantly set up and brilliantly played throughout and will will again show other in other areas of the film is done really well and the ending is done really well just didn't quite work in that moment with Diana's character and Diana's selfishness. Let's get on to something a bit more positive. Somewhere where the themes worked really well was Pedro Pascal's character of Maxwell Lord. He was set up throughout this film really well. He played it really well. I think the instances of his kid being there, uh, 
worked really well to set up the ending, the emotional sort of heart-wrenching ending that we got at the very end. Because he does care about his kid. And although he's selfish, it comes from a place which we can understand. And we get some flashbacks to his childhood and how he was belittled and stuff by his own parents and how his father was, uh, you know, an abuser and uh, hit his mother and all those sort of things. And then we get his relationship with his child, which is kind of, we initially think, well, we can see from their interaction that he does love him, but he has it very warped in his head about what that means. And to him, it means, you know, being someone who his son can be proud of, but by becoming the big man, you know, with loads of wealth and money, who can take care of everything. Um, there's some lovely scenes, you know, where when his son, after he uh, after he absorbs the stone into himself and he becomes the stone and his son uses his wish for his dad to be great. And you, there's genuine, like, emotion on his face that he's like, no, no, don't. And he can't stop him in time because he doesn't want his son to waste his wish on him. He wants him to use it for something for himself. So that relationship is set up really well and played brilliantly by Pedro Pascal as well. And it leads into a really good finale. Now, Wonder Woman 1, I love it. It's a great film. Brilliant film most of the way through. The ending of Wonder Woman 1 is actually its weakest part. First two acts of Wonder Woman 1, brilliant, absolutely amazing. Ending, big CGI monster fight, yeah, it's got, it, it has some flaws. But it's still a great, great film overall. This film kind of does the opposite. We get a weak sort of first two thirds and then a really strong ending. Because again, it links into the Pedro Pascal's character and the, it, it ends with a scene which I don't usually like. There's still a little bit of a CGI fight um, with the cheetah character that Barbara has become. And yeah, the CGI is a little bit dodgy on Cheetah, but you know, it was a, it was an exciting action scene. It was all good. I, I, I have no problems with that other than it being a little bit of ropey CGI. But the emotional impactful ending of when Wonder Woman confronts Maxwell Lord is really good. There's no big dramatic fight. In fact, Wonder Woman is, is kind of pushed back and, and almost broken and she has to appeal to him on an emotional level and then we get this scene where ev she convinces because the tell uh, there's this big you know what she maxwell lord has gone onto every screen in the world and she makes an emotional appeal to the world to revoke their wish to 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 be to give that unselfish act and they do and usually those kind of endings where what equates to a group sort of emotional like positive thinking saves the day. I don't like those. I didn't like it in like Doctor Who when, you know, everybody thought the Doctor's name and that helped him in uh, in end of series three. I don't like it generally. I think generally it's very cheesy and it is a little cheesy, but it works so well with the theming that they've set up throughout this movie that actually it works here and actually leads to a really strong ending and then there beyond that after everybody's wrote their wish she makes him realize what he's done and what he's giving up and what he could lose in his son and ultimately it comes down to her father's love for his son and that was powerful that was really powerful and i don't know if you know these type of things parents and children they they have affected me more in the last five years since I became a parent than or six years since I became a parent than they did before that. So maybe maybe you might get most out of this if you're a parent. But it was it was, you know, the actual only moment of the film which I felt really pulled on my heartstrings was that ending. And it worked really well and fit in with the themes they'd set up. Like I said, those themes I think they faltered with how they dealt with the themes in Diana herself. But with Maxwell Lord, they got it spot on. So yeah, I mean, anything else I have to say about the thing is it's really little things. You know, there were some good, there were some good visual moments. The lightning flying through the air with the lightning was great. But a lot of the flying with the lasso was bad in other situations. You know, the, the visual moments were 
hit and miss. The CGI was hit and miss. Nice reference to the invisible plane. I like the fact that <laughs> Wonder Woman now has her invisible plane. It's a nice little Easter egg reference there. And you know, things like that are all very enjoyable. It was a film with a really strong ending, a weaker first and second half, first and second sort of acts. Well, I mean, after that initial scene, Wonder Woman, as opposed to Diana, doesn't really appear in the film for a good hour. And you can do films like that. Iron Man 3 did that, and I think it worked well there, but it just didn't quite work as well in this film, and it kind of felt like they were dragging it out a little bit too much. Talking of dragging it out, one of the other things I wasn't massively keen on was when Steve Trevor, you know, did his whole montage of, oh, this is strange in the 80s things, and it's, it's playing on a trope that they used in the last film, where Wonder Woman comes to the world of man and, you know, is like, oh, this is odd, how does this work? And we get the montage of her you know, comedy montage of her getting used to the world around her. They did the same thing here with Steve Trevor in the 1980s. It just didn't work as well as the first film. I don't know if it's just because the things they had him do weren't as good or weren't as interesting or weren't as funny, but it just it just dragged far too long. Uh, you know, him going around the Smithsonian, looking at spacesuits and stuff. Uh, not getting what a, you know bin bin is bins can't i mean i know uh, yeah it's a slightly different shape but uh, come on you know what a bin is it, ju it just wasn't as funny as as the reverse had been in the first film so yeah overall brilliant opening weaker first two acts a really strong third act and good theming but let down with how they handled it with diana i think but brilliant villain uh brilliant ending emotional heart-wrenching ending so like i said i'm still kind of processing this i don't know where i fall on this i'm very mixed there's so the things i like are so polar opposite to the things i don't like i don't know where i fall on it kind of somewhere in the middle i guess let me know what you think about this film do you share any of the problems i had with it do you like any of the things i liked about it or different things let me know in the comments below uh, i'd be very interested to hear what everybody else thinks what do, you, what do you think about it in relation to the other DCEU films? Like I said, for me, it's somewhere in the middle. It's not up to the heights of Wonder Woman or Aquaman or um, Harley Quinn is another brilliant one. But nowhere near, it's, it's nowhere near the lows of Suicide Squad either. So, you know, somewhere in the middle. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention Linda Carter, the original 1970s Wonder Woman from the TV show, making a nice cameo appearance in the mid credit scene. Very nice indeed. Thanks for watching, let me know what you think in the comments below, and I will see you for more geeky pop culture content soon. Bye bye.